Okay, welcome back to this um, painting that I'm working on, uh, that I call an alasomorph. Uh, we're going to be continuing with white today. Let's have a look at our learning intentions. We are just going to draw and fill in using white. I'm using Windsor and Newton Artisan Water Mixable uh, White. And what I want to do is show the maximum contrast in this artwork by uh, by going in with my darkest darks and my lightest lights. There. How will we know if we've done a good job by the end of this session? Well, if we look at our success criteria, we'll be able to use a rigger brush like we did uh, with the, um, the black that we made with um, raw umber and French ultramarine blue. Um, and we'll be able to make a nice crisp line. Um, I considered using masking tape to um, create a stencil, but because of the um, mottled surface of the canvas board, there wasn't enough adhesion using masking tape. Uh, if I was working on paper, then I might have a uh, greater success. Let's go across to the demo class and we'll have a look at our fight. There we go. Okay. So. A little bit of white. Onto the mixing surface. Still just using water. To try and get the right consistency. I'll revisit this several times with water. Make sure it flows well. And um, the thing about paint is different paints have different kind of um, qualities. And I've noticed that this white paint is quite stubborn. It takes a little bit more to loosen it up, make it workable. But I don't want to thin this too much because I need it to be opaque but in my experience so far with this I'm aware that um, the water dries out this white fairly quickly it will get to a kind of tacky uh, consistency quite quickly compared with some of the other paints. So there we go. I think I'll begin with the largest area, which is the eyeball. And having thought about this, I wish to correct the direction of that line. So even, even with this kind of dilution, it flows like ink, which is nice. Let me try and follow this beak here. Get the difficult bit out of the way first. There. 
And so it's just a matter of filling in the areas. And so a lot of what we do in studio practice is quite quotidian, quite mundane. And involves a lot of repetition. And I feel that if I don't narrate this could be uh, quite uninteresting. There. There was a mistake there that I need to correct. So the titanium white is uh, famously opaque. And so it can be used like a sort of tipex to correct areas. I'm going across the iris. That's okay because I'm going to overpaint this. And I'm trying to create the thickness of the eyelid, would be there. It's going to cast a shadow so I can reinstate that information when I get to that stage. But now, again, it's the tricky bit to do with the beak. So holding the brush quite low down to the ferrule, firmly planting my hand on the surface. And it's my hand that's moving. not the tips of the fingers until I get to that very end bit there. Okay. I'm looking at the screen and so the, the white is really popping against the stain that we've uh, uh, introduced early on in this session. I was wondering about, I was in two minds about um, going in with a, a pure titanium white, even if it is mixed to quite a diluted mix like this. Because um, you know, if you use your lightest value, like white, where do you go to for accent? And so what I've thought of doing was uh, actually dulling it down to make a kind of uh, buff titanium by mixing in some burnt umber or raw umber. I need to concentrate here. Okay.
Just put in a little bit of shine on these uh, eyelashes. I'm already considering this decision. I'm reconsidering it. But if nothing else, I get some extra brush control practice out of it. If I'm not happy, I can just reinstate with black and correct that way. So this is okay. Um, fairly happy with that. I've noticed since beginning to live stream that while I like this paint to be inky, I have noticed that if we leave it to go tacky, it is actually a little bit easier to control when it's just on the turn of um, uh, drying out. I'm just beginning to dry a little bit and the tackiness gives a kind of adhesion which makes it slightly more easy to control. However, waiting to the correct moment is a bit of a dark art. So this highlight here on the pupil I've been thinking is uh, fairly moon-like and I have done elasomorphs before where the moon was connected <coughs> I sort of string like this. Now, um, being so heavily diluted as it is, I don't think there's any problems with adhesion, but also it's not the most opaque version of it. So I'm kind of hoping that the stain underneath is going to temper it a little bit so that if I need to at some point reintroduce the very uh, strongest highlights, then I can uh, reintroduce them on top. I'm getting a sense that some of the underpainting is coming through and so it's not the purest white and it might allow me to do that. But if I was dissatisfied, I could always use uh, glazes to nudge the white into the, the kind of color directions in which I want to go. So we've still got options. White can be seen as her tip X and black can be viewed as her um, you know the black version of the tip X. This is my smallest rigger brush the Rosemary & Co uh, Series 771 and it's a size 1 uh, rigger. And even with this, I'm wishing that I had a smaller brush.
And because some of the smaller checks as they move away into the distance, like these ones here, are quite small spaces. I am hoping that the opacity of the white is going to allow me to correct any mistakes that I've made. For instance, there's a very noticeable mistake here. This line here. And here. The pattern is inconsistent. So I have to do this. And that was a mistake that was evident at the drawing stage. Because I'm painting on top of black here, I've gone into the thicker less inky mix uh, on my palette there because it has to mask out the black rather than the uh, umber look that we have here from the umber and olive stain that we laid down first of all I have considered using masking before, and masking does work on paper. But this uh, surface has imperfections on it, which means that that particular masking tape didn't work so well prior to uploading. What I'm trying to do here is lift out some of the paint there because that's flooded and uh, borrow it from here to deposit here. The inkiness of it allows it to move quite nicely and it's self-leveling oh, there's a little correction there okay That part helps reveal the shape of the bird. Okay. So what I need to do here is plant, press, plant, and then drag with the whole hand. Okay. And similarly on this side, it's difficult working top to bottom. I'm going to have to do it from towards me this time and turning the board so I can monitor the line that's being made. Once the outline's okay, we can relax and uh, just fill it in a little bit more comfortably. Drop the material in. Once material is there, it's slightly easier to nudge it in the direction that you want it to go. Okay. 
So when you're painting with oils, there's this idea of, you know, we put fat upon lean. But we must remember as well that we can put lean upon lean. And we can do this severally. So I could come back with the same mix tomorrow. Um, and place it on top. And not be worried about observing the fat upon lean rule. So it is possible that you can put lean upon lean, fat upon fat, and fatter upon fatter as you work through the painting layers. But it is also true that we can add several layers. of lean, fat and fatter. So I will largely be working uh, lean upon lean as I like my paint to be inky like this. But if I want to observe that rule, the fat upon lean rule, uh, there are other mediums or media that I can use in this series, in the water mixable series. Such as water mixable linseed oil and water mixable stand oil I'm not so happy when I'm painting in such a way as I'm dragging towards myself when I'm making a line I much prefer to move away but I suppose the advantage of having created a chessboard which is uneven is that if you do corrections on it if you do go outside the line um, it doesn't spoil the end product it just looks like a deviation in a chessboard which is already deviating There is an argument for me against using uh, masking to simplify this because I actually enjoy the act of painting like this. It feels good. I'm going to have to drag this line towards me. There. I'm having a little bit of trouble resting my hand without interfering with the spaces that I've painted already. So perhaps I need to invest in a mall stick. M A H L mall stick. And that'll allow me to lean over because this is becoming a little bit problematic.
Yeah, so the benefit of uh, doing this for me is, and remember my, my channel is Guitar Therapy, Art, Guitar, and uh, the therapeutic benefits of creativity, is that with ME there's a lot of muscular pain. And I tend not to notice it so much when I'm doing this. And also, when painting, it demands your concentration, unless you're narrating as you go. Yeah, I can see the paint there. If you look at the palette, it's beginning to stiffen up. So it's getting the balance right of the right kind of uh, tackiness there. And rolling the rigger into a nice point and being able to control it. So, unless you're actually narrating, as I have to do for these live streams, um, it demands total concentration. And if you're thinking about this, you're not thinking about problems. That may be concerning you. And so art and creativity in general is just good for mental health. And part of it as well as, you know, a part of having something that is limiting is the notion of feeling productive and able to contribute something. So creativity is very good for um, self-validation really. To feel that you can contribute something. And as well as that, if you make an end product that you're proud of, that is also good for issues of self-esteem and um, self-worth. This is where I need the mouse stick here. Because I'm rotating this so that the I can view the line that I'm making without obscuring it with my hand. Correcting the line there so that it joins up. To me, that's just a little bit too um, it's the paint is stiffening up too much that it doesn't flow, and so so when I have to do this to fill in the area rather than just let the the paint flow, so the inkiness of the paint flows a lot better, it sits on top and you just nudge it in where you want it and it pulls, it floods the area that you want to visit a little bit more. So at this stage 
you can argue that um, drawing and painting are the same activity. So during the course of my studies, uh, we discussed um, whether or not drawing, well, drawing is dry painting and painting is wet drawing. So some people don't see a distinction. Some people don't care. <laughs> it's just enjoyable. It just feels good. And every painting that you do teaches you a little bit more about the next one. And for instance, I was able to um, complete my BA honours, seldom doing an oil painting. And so the reason I'm doing these is actually to familiarise myself with paints that I bought years and years ago and didn't use. And so I actually like this uh, learning experience. Okay, that's not flooding particularly well, but it may be good for lining. Nope, I'm going to have to work towards me this time. Okay, outline done. We can flood the inside with paint. What I do recommend is for anybody who's doing any kind of creativity like this is to have a little notepad or notebook, sketchbook or some such and to write down what you've learned from your experimenting. It's a good investigative cycle to come up with, you know, something that you want to find out. So ask yourself the question and then carry out some experiments and then evaluate how well your experiments were. And that leads on to the next question. Okay, I'm fairly happy with that. Okay, if I fill in this negative shape here, which is the chessboard, This little negative space here helps to design, uh, define the positive form of the branch where the hummingbird is resting and the underside of the hummingbird.
if I keep going with these elasomorphs, I think I want to correct that line. Maybe make it angle a little bit there, just a fraction, uh, so that it curves away that as the waterfall's falling away. It just imitates that line. If I continue with these uh, lassomorph doodles, what I'd like to do is bring in greater amounts of realism into the chessboard. So for instance, try and incorporate an effect which makes the chessboard look marble. So instead of just black and white, flat, which is okay for you know a strong design, that some kind of marbling is um, included. Draw this line here. The other aspect of doing this is um, practice. So the more you, you practice using your brush, the more confident you are in um, in your brush control. The more practiced you become, and Part of it, an element of success is confidence. If you approach it confidently, that does increase your chances of success. So again, okay. There's a little tiny little bit I want to correct here. There's a little bit of um, staining appearing between the junction of the black and the white. And that's okay. If it's what you want to do, that's tolerable. But in this one, I'm looking for something a little bit more crisp. In my earlier ones, um, this one's here, which were, you know, begun about a fortnight ago. The edges are not so fussy. So this one um, is less precise. But I think even at that, you can see some blue outlining, outlining where the original drawing was done. It has a certain kind of naive uh, charm. So, but my intention in painting this one is to improve the deg degree of control in my own brushwork and to become increasingly more uh, practiced handling this paint. I can see a correction there. It's nose. That 
So I suppose that's a problem with painting something that is as detailed as this. Is being able to place your hand. Ideally. Now if we were using acrylics, and that's largely what I used in my studies. Um, these areas that are painted would probably have been dry by now. And so I could rest my hand anywhere without interference. So I suppose this is one of the drawbacks of using oils. That doesn't feel right. So again, this time I'm going to have to work towards myself. Okay. And can I reach in here? No. Tricky. So you can influence the trajectory of the lines that you're making just by pressing harder, just by pressing more firmly. You can widen your line uh, and influence your outline. And then you can relax as you colour in the boxes. <laughs> I'm expecting a little bit of colour shift. I'll put my hand on some white, on a white area. You can see here. Now, where did I pick that up from? It's hard to tell. I'm going to revisit this one, see if a second layer is going to. Help. Right, so there's a little bit of marbling there, so maybe that's a technique that I can use. Glaze white over a very dark patch. And um, Revisit it to create some texture that will be contributing to the marble illusion that I want to create. My dog has just visited me. So my original intention for actually using it was quite modest, for using oil paint was quite modest. I just wanted to be able to draw a line and I knew that that was to do with how I mixed my paints. And so now I know that the inkiness of the paint will allow me to write my name like that. So um, I, so that was one objective that um, I tried to learn. And so now my 
artistic goals have changed a little and the artworks that I'm painting and this one here is the largest of the elasomorphs that I've painted to date Okay, you've stayed with me for quite some time while I've ruminated on art. Let me just remind myself of what we're doing. So today's intention was to continue with white. Okay, you can see the design on that slide. Um, next we were learning to draw and fill in with white paint yep and we've noticed that even with a fairly heavy dilution there is no problem with um, it adhering to the surface so and also we have the ability to use it as a kind of tip x so we can correct uh, any areas that we, we feel need correcting. Draw and fill in with a uh, white paint. Yep. We've been pr practicing um, how to control the brush. Control the pressure. back into the classroom there okay and I've done um, a lot of work so far blocking in the large areas like the eye the main areas that I want with white and um, I think I'm going to bring this to a conclusion um, but when the camera is no longer rolling I'm going to finish off the checkerboard. I'm going to try and bring in some highlights here, which make it look as if the water is flowing down, cascading down like a waterfall. And I'm going to put in the white bars across here, which uh, create the frets uh, on the guitar fingerboard. So. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, but I think we'll wind it up there. Thank you so much. Hopefully see you for for the next um, installment, which may be tomorrow. Thanks now. Enjoy creativity wherever you are. Bye-bye.